Hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming to, the, to our talk. My name is uh, Ahmad Sadegi from Technical University Darmstadt in Germany and also Intel Collaborative Research Institute for Secure Computing. Um, Christopher and I are going to present this talk. Um, this is a joint work with our colleagues from UC Irvine and Immunet um, Incorporation. So the title suggests that this is a defensive work. It's not a work about attacks, but it is based on our experience of the several last years on runtime attacks and in general exploits specifically based on code reuse attacks. Um, so let me just m motivate. This is amazing that uh, after so many years, uh, we are still concerned with many problems uh, that are actually three decades old. Uh, legacy is actually the, our problem. Um, there are, of course, we, we, we want more functionality. We uh, sacrifice security for functionality. Our IT systems are getting more complex. Um, nearly everybody has access to smartphones and uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of applications. Um, and the situation is not changing. So we have many developers, uh, different developers with different intentions and different knowledge, specifically about security. Um, and the subject that it seems to be very attractive uh, to the research community not, not community, not only in the academia, but also in industry, industrial research, um, is that how can we build secure systems from insecure code? This sounds a bit odd, somehow contradictory, but it seems that this is the general understanding, at least currently, that we just need to protect our uh, legacy code, our native code. And this is the, actually one of the reasons why <clears throat> I would like to just explain um, the fact that just protecting insecure systems by adding more and more uh, new stuff is not really the ultimate solution, but it seems that we are uh, not going to end with such a fancy solution as we wish. So if you go back to the history, um, I just put some of the um, attacks that have been published, at least those that we, are, we know about. Um, and interestingly, many of these uh, runtime attacks uh, were used in um, hacker community, but not really by, by academia. It, it just got attractive for academia um, as they started to think about how they can put it together, how they can uh, give tasks to PhD students that uh, regard software security. So one of the papers that I'm aware of... Due to technical difficulties, a portion of this presentation was not recorded. We are joining the program already in progress. Instruction sequences are very short. Um, they end with a return instruction. And when you put them together, we call them gadget because they uh, realize they uh, implement a certain task, certain functionality like load, store. Um, and when we combine the gadgets, we have the attack payload. And um, it's, it's a debatable, but... Uh, Return-oriented programming can be seen as a generalization of return to libc. Okay, how does it work? Just a simple example. If you have a <coughs> program stack, and let's say these are the gadgets that uh, sequences of instructions that the adversary wants to chain together, then <coughs> each of them is, has kind of return. So usually assume that the adversary even wants to change the uh, content of registers. So first, there is a vulnerability. This is the assumption. And then the attacker puts uh, his or her stuff on, on the stack. And this is con uh, consisting of um, return addresses and also those values that the attacker wants to uh, compute with. So this is a uh, uh, stack pointer. And then the first return address, when you just go to the first sequence, which is the first gadget, for example, and then the stack pointer is moved, and then you go after the return, you use the, 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 the return address which is on the stack and go to the second sequence where the register values is, are popped and change the content of the 
register based on the values that the adversary has already chosen. And then it goes uh, further, further again. So kind of loop that is just continuing until the, the attack is uh, completed. So this is the principle of, of this attack. And uh, one of the basic problems also in the industrial solution is that when you use heuristic because of efficiency aspects is how big should this gadget space be that I can still run an attack so that I can put my gadgets together. And since uh, it is shown that ROP attacks are Turing complete, that means you can uh, generate arbitrary behavior of the program. So you can chain together whatever you want, build together what, whatever malicious code you want. Um, and from that point of view, there is actually no point to say how big my space could be. There is no answer to that because it has been shown that even with a very small uh, space of, of code, or that's a code space, you can run such an, att such an attack. Okay, what is the adversary model in general uh, that we are talking about and also the solution that we are going to present in uh, this adversary model where uh, the application, you have code, you have data, and we assume that this application has also scripting capabilities because most web browsers, for example, have uh, this uh, capability. And we also assume that protections of modern systems like uh, memory pages are writable or executable are already in place. So we make the work of the adversary harder. Also, we assume that there is a randomization because most of the realistic systems, real world systems, they are using ASLR in conventional sense, so to say. Um, but we assume about the adversary itself that it can uh, disclose memory, so it gets side channels, uh, uh, side channel information. It can write to the memory. And it can also perform arbitrary computation because it has access to the um, scripting engine. So the scripting engine can, can be seen as an oracle that is working for the adversary. As I mentioned, this is a very hot topic of research currently, and the uh, security conferences are full of uh, papers against um, code reuse uh, attacks, um, and it's going on. So there are two main defenses that have been emerged in, in this area. One of them is code randomization, or in general, diversity, code diversity, and the other one is control flow integrity. So in this talk, we are going to focus on code randomization, but let me just give you a flavor of what is actually, in general, a big picture, the differences between them. So, or let's say pros and cons. So randomization has low performance because you just randomize, permute uh, something in your uh, memory. It scales because you can use it for, for um, you can use it for uh, more complex software like a browser or operating system. However, if you have information disclosure or you have low entropy randomization, then you can break it. Control flow integrity gives you some kind of formal assurance because if you remember about the control flow graph of a code, when the code is executing, you check at every branching, the best case would be at every branching you check if the benign flow, what was intended by the, by the developer is followed or not. If not, you just stop the execution. So you can also do a formal analysis on that in theory. In practice, beside the fact that we, have, we, we can't uh, uh, get a complete uh, control flow graph, uh, a real precise one, uh, there is also a trade-off between performance and security because when you do so many checks for all branching, it gets very um, inefficient, and so you need to make compromises, and this compromise means compromise in security, as it has been shown many times in the last three, four years. And it is very challenging to use it for a complex software, as mentioned. Okay, so let us go through the co code randomization. ASLR, I think most of you know what ASLR is, and there is something which is called fine-grained ASLR. So you don't, you don't just, um, you don't just uh, push in a random offset um, your, your memory or your addresses in your memory. You just try to make it more complicated. What does it mean? If you have a set of instructions with returns, you can do different things. 
you can uh, add different granularities. That means you can permute functions, you can even go to the level of instructions that you randomize uh, instruction addresses. And there have been lots of effort in this area. Unfortunately, um, fine grade randomization was shown to be vulnerable to the so-called GTROP, just-in-time return-oriented programming. It was presented by us at, in Black Hat 2013. And it is actually relatively simple. <coughs> I will come to that. So what it does, it undermines any fine-grained uh, randomization scheme. It shows that memory disclosure, which was, I think, for, for many people who are working in in, in software security, it is clear that memory disclosure is a realistic assumption that you get kind of side channel from your memory, uh, if it's a function pointer or any other address. Um, but memory disclosure was considered to be something which is there, but it is not so crucial. But we see that it's very crucial, given the attacks of the last years. And it has been also shown that you can do that with the real world uh, exploits. So how does it work? I just explained to you very shortly uh, how does uh, GDROP work. So we want to, uh, we assume that we have a single address that leads to the leak, leakage of a whole memory page. So you have an address, like a function pointer, and you have a memory page. And since memory pages, um, let's say, are um, four kilobyte aligned memory, so we know the address, we can simply compute the, the starting and the ending point. And then we know that this page, um, this function A, we know the address. So if we disassemble this page, then we get maybe a call to another function, function B. And from that, we have another pointer to another uh, page, and we disassemble that page as well. And that goes on at runtime through the scripting engine of the, remember the adversary model, we assume that we have access to a scripting engine. Okay, so in that sense, you generate enough gadgets that you can put them together and <clears throat> put the payload at the end by chaining these gadgets together to achieve your uh, goal. And these are just examples for interrupt, for loading, for storing, for, for moving. Um, and then you can also automatize that uh, by just uh, using a high uh, level uh, language so that you you just chain all these things together in a in a don't have to do everything manually this has been shown that it's very crucial attack so all the randomization techniques need to add other defenses to be uh, uh, to defend against uh, jitro so now this slide should show you all the effort, actually, to summarize all the effort of the past uh, years on how to, let's say, mitigate um, randomization attacks like GDROP in the adversary that I was talking about. So we start again, we summarize. A single point di pointer disclosure can simply um, bypass ASLR, conventional ASLR, where you just have a random offset. Then we have fine-grained randomization. That one was bypassed by GDROP. Then we have direct code disclosure, which, which is actually what GDROP is, is uh, uh, exploiting. Direct, we call it direct code uh, disclosure because if you have a pointer, you have a direct access to, uh, to the whole code page. So for that, how can we prevent the adversary of uh, doing that? We just make the code page execute only. So you cannot read it. You have the pointer, but you cannot read it. However, it has been shown that this is a problem itself because there is something that we call, we define it as indirect code disclosure. You get a code, a pointer to the code, but not the code itself, but that is enough information uh, to put a, um, to just chain again our gadgets. So what we do, and this is why this talk is all about, where to go, it is code pointer hiding, and Christopher is going to explain that. And what does it mean? It means that if the adversary doesn't know where the code pointers, like virtual function tables, uh, or 
return addresses are um, that is done by giving the adversary only one address. And this is the address by using the good old idea of trampoline. And this is a kind of list of jumps. The adversary knows this address, but from that address, the adversary don't know, doesn't know where are the, uh, actually, the address of, of the codes. OK. Now, the problem is, if we have trampolines, then the adversary may have some idea what is behind those addresses which is in the list of trampoline. So for that, we need to kind of uh, obfuscate his view. And this is done by randomization of the registers. In that case, we want to break the, the gadget chain. This raises the bar. But it doesn't mean that it is the, the perfect solution because you have a, a certain number of, a limited number of registers. And there are maybe ways to also bypass that. We just think that it could be. And for that, there is also a solution. So this was kind of effort of the community, um, the academic community, but also the industrial research community to improve the randomization by adding code pointer hiding. And the, uh, they raised the bar heavily. So this is a very good news. And now, the system that we are going to explain to you uh, in this talk is called Redactor. And it's a defensive system, as I mentioned. Uh, and how to uh, resist um, memory disclosure with more detail. And this is what Christopher is going to explain. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, no. No? Yes. Yes, no. Very good. Um, yeah, I'm going to explain how Redactor works what we implemented, and what we have to consider during the implementation. But let me first uh, give you a quick overview of our goals. Um, so our system should be secure, of course. We want to prevent big code reuse attacks Ahmad just mentioned. And we do randomization. So and as Ahmad mentioned, um, memory disclosure is one of the biggest threat to randomization, because if the attacker can read or disclose the randomization secret, um, he can basically undo it. Um, we want to be comprehensive. That means we don't only want to protect um, ahead of time, time uh, compiled code, but also JIT code. And of course, it should be uh, practical. That, that is, we don't want to protect Hello World applications or the Windows calculator. Um, we want to protect real browsers, complex software, so our solutions must scale to really big and complex programs. And of course, we want to be fast because nobody is going to use our solution, even, even if it provides perfect security, if there's an overhead of 100 or 120 percent. So let me first say how we prevent uh, direct memory disclosure. So in theory, this is fairly simple. We just have to ensure that the adversary cannot read uh, code pages. However, in practice, there are some challenges. Um, mainly, so. There were some previous efforts on implementing execute-only memory, but these were software-emulated um, solutions, um, which are basically not secure. So if there's a page executed, it automatically also becomes readable, and an adversary can exploit this. What we want to have is execute-only memory enforced by the hardware, and of course it should run on current hardware. So we don't want to depend on, uh, on any legacy features uh, or anything else. And the way we do this is we use memory virtualization. So, but let me first give you a quick uh, recap on how memory protection in general works uh, on x86. So we have virtual addresses, which gets translated uh, using a so-called page table to physical addresses. Physical addresses is the real address in your, in your memory. And during the translation, um, the memory management unit can um, enforce some permissions. However, the advantage, uh, disadvantage uh, of this x86 page tables is that as soon as uh, your code page is executable, it is also readable. So there's no extra flag uh, 
which you, where you can say, okay, I only want to have this page executable but not readable. Um, same goes for um, having a page writable. Um, so when a page is writable, it's also readable. And in theory, also executable, um, the way the vendors solve this issue, they introduce another bit to the page table, which basically, basically says, okay, this page should not be executable. Um, but as I said, we don't get execute only. However, if we enable memory virtualization, um, we actually add another layer of translation. So our um, virtual addresses get first translated to guest physical addresses, uh, which then, again, get translated using the extended page tables to host physical addresses, which are then the real uh, physical addresses. And the extended page tables allow us to set the permission bits individually. That is, we can actually say, okay, a page should only be executable. And the effective permission for a page is then determined by the intersection of the permission of the page table and the extended page table. So we can actually mark code pages as execute only. Um, as you can see, for all other pages, we basically um, set the permission in the extended page table to read, write, execute. So that the effective permission of the page is um, determined by the permission set in the page table. Because again, it's the intersection of both. So this is how we uh, can prevent direct memory disclosure. Um, but as mentioned before, there's still this thing called indirect memory disclosure. And I can give you a quick example um, on how this actually works. So consider an application where we have execute uh, only memory enabled and we have two functions. So we apply some fine-grained randomization um, and permutate the function order. So the attacker can no longer know where these functions are located. However, the attacker does know that we only permutate functions and that the content of the function is still the same. So the, all the instructions remain the same. And what the attacker can do, um, he can leak pointers to these functions. Um, it, doesn't, it actually doesn't matter whether the function pointer points to the beginning of the function or into the middle of the function. Uh, once he has a pointer, to somewhere in the function, he can infer the instructions within the function and then um, get gather his gadgets. So what we are going to do about that? We do code pointer hiding. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, the, we have a, a famous computer scientist called David Wheeler. He once said, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level, level of indirection. And yeah, this is basically what we did. We added another layer of indirection um, in form of so-called trampolines. Um, these are basically just jump, direct jump instructions. However, since they reside in execute-only memory, the attacker cannot disclose um, the destination of these jumps. So while the attacker do know the address of a trampoline, he does not know where the trampoline is going to. And an application can, um, obviously knows where, which trampoline to use and can just use a trampoline and then go into the function. Um, note, um, we, own, we also permutate um, the order of the uh, trampolines itself, so an attacker cannot just disclose one trampoline address and then also infer all the others. So here's our, uh, coming to the implementation, here's our design of Redactor. So what we did, um, we modified um, a compiler. Uh, in particular, we modified LLVM. So one of the most crucial things is that LLVM or the compiler does not put data into the code section because our code section will be marked as execute only and when there's data in there which the program wants to use, it will just crash. Next, we apply some fine-grained random code randomization in form of function permutation, since this is a very cheap way of, in, in sense of performance, to um, apply randomization. And we also do register randomization, which I will come to later again. And of course, we, uh, for every code pointer which is used uh, within the um, application, we create some trampolines so we can do code pointer hiding. So at runtime, it basically looks like this. Um, 
we implement a very thin hypervisor. This is really just to enable memory virtualization and can be done in, um, we have like under 500 lines of C code. Um, it really only enables memory virtualization and sets up the extended page table to have execute only memory, um, but the rest of the operating system will execute uh, on the bare metal system, so there's no interaction uh, required anymore. And uh, we also did some modification to the operating system because currently they, I mean, there's no support for execute only memory uh, natively by ZX86 hardware uh, page tables. So we also had to uh, change the operating system a bit to make use of the feature that we are providing through the thin hypervisor. From there on, um, we can run both applications, like a redacted application, so which is protected by our scheme, which will just notify the operating system that every code page of the application should be marked as execute only, as well as legacy application, where the application will just say, okay, I want to have my code pages as readable and executable, so we don't break anything. We can have protected and unprotected uh, applications on the same system. Um, it might look not so good to have a hypervisor in there, and uh, actually it's also not really needed anymore. Um, after we finished our work, uh, Intel announced uh, their protection keys, which are meant to be prot uh, to protect keys in memory. However, we can also uh, exploit this feature to have execute only memory. So we actually don't depend on the hypervisor anymore. So now we can protect um, ahead of time compiled code. But uh, yeah, as we said, like, Sophisticated attacks are normally not launched against uh, the Windows calculator. The ca calculator is more in uh, yeah, aftermatch. No, what we want to protect um, applications which are target of uh, sophisticated attacks, which is uh, which are normally launched through, uh, through scripting engines. So we want to protect browsers or document viewers, and they have JIT code. JIT code is a little bit um, hard to protect or a little bit uh, we sh must handle it differently because it frequently changes or modifies the code. So it is treated, uh, the code is actually treated as code and data. The way we solve this problem is that we separate the, f uh, clean, cleanly separate the phases where the, uh, where the JIT compiler needs to treat the code as data and where it can be treated as, um, as normal code. So during the phases where uh, some uh, compilation optimiz optimization is applied, we map the code as read and writable, and for the rest of the time we uh, wrap it as executable. So yeah, this is basically um, our solution, and we modify, also modified a uh, JIT compiler, um, which I will talk about in the next in the evaluation. Um, for the evaluation, we want to see, okay, can we really apply our um, solution to the real world? There, uh, and we did this uh, during different things. So for performance, uh, we actually we took the spec benchmarking tools. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically it's a collection of programs um, which get some input, and then based on that you can uh, you can apply your modification. Let it be compiler modification or some runtime modifications and it measures the CPU overhead. And we use that to be comparable to other solutions because everybody is apparently using it. Um, but we also use uh, the Chromium benchmarks to get a feel for how it would affect real-world software. And as mentioned before, we also evaluate the practicability um, by protecting the Chromium browser, which is in our uh, view, point of view a very, fairly complex uh, piece of software and we also um, modified the JavaScript engine of Chromium V8 um, to test if, if everything's okay. So here are the performance numbers. Um, as you can see, for most of them, they're fairly low. We have some spikes, but um, let's focus on the uh, geometric mean, the average overhead of our solution. And here you can see that the full uh, redactor, so having every protection enabled, we get roughly 6.4% overhead. Um, but notice that 
by only enabling the hypervisor and execute only memory, we already, uh, this introduces 2% overhead. So actually by using the different way to have execute only memory, being, uh, let it be the uh, interprotection keys or uh, maybe Intel or AMD wants to add in the future to the actual page table some execute only bit, then we could cut the performance by another uh, 2%, which will leave us at roughly 4% overhead, which is uh, very practical. We also did evaluation for the V8 engine, and there we get uh, similar numbers, so between 6.2 and 7.8% overhead. And actually for the Chromium browser, for its benchmarks, we only get, so which test mainly the smoothness and responsiveness of the web pages and of the browser, we only get 4% overhead. So it's, if you use the Chromium browser with our protection applied, you, doesn't, you don't actually feel the, the difference. But is our solution um, secure? Um, yes. Uh, we can, we build up resilience against direct and indirect memory disclosure, um, which leaves the attacker basically to guessing where the gadgets are, because we really ensure that every uh, executable code resides in non-readable memory. Um, however, what we cannot prevent is that an attacker discloses trampoline addresses. And in our adversary model, the, ad, uh, although we do some randomization also there, but in our the adversary model, we have to assume that sooner or later the attacker will get access to every trampoline address. And there are actually two types of uh, trampoline addresses. So we have trampolines which, point, uh, which jump into the code and at function beginnings. And for classical ROP, you usually want to aim for trampolines which jump into the code. Um, one thing return to the program heavily depends on is um, the data flow between individual registers. So for example, if an attacker wants to do return to the programming to um, execute a specific system call, he wants to make sure that he uses one, he uses one gadget which loads um, a specific value into a specific register. And by applying register randomization, we can ensure that um, the first gadget which he used, for example, to load uh, a value in register A will no longer use register A, but maybe B, C, or D. So and this will break the attack sooner or later. But there's this other kind of trampolines which point at the function beginning. And actually, um, this doesn't make a difference for the attacker, like if he has the direct address of the function or a trampoline which jumps to the function. In either case, you will be, uh, he can execute the whole function. And actually, we have shown that we can also launch Turing complete attacks, so the same thing as Rob, basically, using uh, virtual functions. Um, and here's how we protect these functions. This is now for V tables, but it basically applies to every uh, table of functions. We split the uh, function table into two parts. One part resides in the readable memory and only contains a pointer to the, uh, to the part which resides in execute only memory. And here we have, again, trampolines. However, we don't only have trampolines. We introduce some uh, fake entries we call booby traps, which, when executed, just terminate the program. And th we do this because, let's consider we have a function table which has only two entries. So it would be fairly easy for an attacker to get, um, just by using brute force attack, which function uh, resides at which location. But by uh, adding booby trap addresses, we first increase the entropy and also build up resilience against brute force attacks because when an attacker executes a booby trap, we automatically shut down the program and possibly also maybe notify um, an intrusion detection sy uh, system that we don't want to, um, I don't know, uh, that we make sure that the specific web page or specific document cannot be opened by the user anymore. So this, li this limits the um, ability of the attacker to brute force um, everything. And again, it's an execute-only memory, so the attacker can never know where the booby trap is and where the real entry is. But the application, which was compiled using, uh, which is aware of these uh, booby traps and the randomization, uh, obviously can use it without breaking the program. 
So to conclude our um, our defense technique, um, code reuse attacks are a severe threat. Uh, this is acknowledged by the industry. Uh, we have seen that Microsoft and Google, they built up defenses against these um, these attacks. However, um, they all, they have to uh, um, they have to make it performant and legacy compliant. So there's always some way around it. Um, with Redactor, we built the first uh, hardware-enforced execute-only uh, fine-grip memory, memory randomization scheme for current x86 hardware. Um, we are resilient against both direct and indirect code disclosure, and um, we can protect complex and real-world things like JIT code or the Chromium browser. And with that, um, okay, so you want me to say something about? Yeah, you can. Okay. Just <laughs> Okay, it's uh, they're coming soon. Actually, I don't know why, why I should say it. Um, so we we talked about uh, Redactor as a software um, or hardware assisted uh, um, solution. Um, also, something that we call Redactor Plus Plus, which is uh, as uh, Christopher was mentioning, um, how you can protect against whole function reuse. These are some new class of. Uh, attacks that are actually simply said are um, similar to uh, return to libc attacks, something that is known for for many many years, but still very challenging to uh, uh, to stop it. Um, other things that we are doing uh, currently is um, also together with industrial partners is um, how to um, use these techniques, randomizations, for example, techniques. Uh, with added uh, mitigation um, mechanisms for mobile platforms. And because there we have another world, maybe the, there we don't have um, hardware support for execute only, uh, not in all platforms. And uh, I don't know who, if, if you are familiar with uh, embedded systems, so the, in the embedded system world, uh, security is a mess. And, and embedded... Uh, um, systems are used in many, uh, let's say, even safety-critical uh, applications from automotive to uh, critical infrastructures. And these attacks, I mean, return-oriented programming attacks for embedded systems, maybe it is too uh, advanced, but there are return-oriented programming attacks on, on embedded systems. And since this, uh, this area is not explored as, as PC and uh, server area, I'm sure that in future we have very advanced attacks on, on those systems as well. And the buzzword is here, IoT, so Internet of Things. Uh, for me, they're all embedded systems that are connected to each other, and that will have another dimension, because once you attack one of them, maybe you can have a crossover, let's say, infection to other devices. Um, this is why I personally think, beside the, the aspect of software and randomization, because it is very efficient, also for embedded systems. One thing that we are also considering is other approaches, as I mentioned at the beginning, like control flow integrity. And um, in that sense, we have collaboration with Intel, where hardware-based control flow integrity are considered as a, a good option. Um, this is another approach than randomization. It guarantees the control flow of your program. At least it gives you in practice, it gives you some guarantees. And uh, that means um, extending the CPU instructions with uh, specific instructions that are used for control flow integrity. With that, I come to the end of the talk. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>